So the main goal is to understand the response of star lines to different therapeutics, and for that we have used multiple approaches, uh, focusing on the biochemistry. Oh, we are starting to collaborate on that with mass spectrometry, and this project will focus, so this presentation will focus on the transcranial aspect, and uh, there's a, basically the main idea is to use kinase inhibitors to probe those cells and understand uh, their cellular network. As I mentioned, we're using cancer cell lines, uh, and in that talk, I will mainly uh, discuss the statistical analysis on that data set. So in brief, uh, uh, what we have done in the past is measuring the level of RTK uh, and the activity of those RTK uh, using ELISA. We also have profiled how the different cell line responds to ligands, especially growth factors, and uh, also looking at how uh, kinase inhibitor inhibit growth, so using microscopy to count cells and obtain a, a growth inhibition curve after three days. In brief, uh, uh, breast cancer, because I'm going to just point out three uh, important points that are going to be coming out in this presentation. So the first is that breast cancer are divided in three subtypes that are defined by the expression of some receptors. So we have the ERB2 subtype. We have the hormone receptor uh, positive subtype where either the estrogen or the progesterone receptor are uh, highly expressed. And the last subtype is defined by the lack of any overexpression, which is called the triple negative. And uh, in general, there's a high occurrence of mutation in the pathway, especially the piatric AKT pathway. And breast cancer are known to be particularly responsive to ligands, so there is clearly uh, the signaling pathway, especially the induced by growth factors, are clearly important for breast cancer. So what we did in the, in the past, and that has been published uh, now two years ago, is profiling those uh, breast cancer cell lines. So this is the basal profile, as you see here, is the expression of different receptors, as seen at the bottom here, either the receptor levels or the phosphoreceptors. Everything was measured by ELISA, uh, and then cluster uh, according to the levels. We see uh, three main clusters. The bottom one, the largest one, comprised mainly triple negative, but also some ER2 amplified cell lines. Uh, the second cluster called B2 in green uh, contains mainly the HR positive, so the hormone receptor cell lines. And there's a large small cluster of ER2 amplified and a few cell lines that are actually clustering outside of any large cluster. So what we see here is some kind of diversity across the different cell lines. So the subtype is clearly an enrichment by subtype in those clusters, but for example, the ER2 amplifier spread between the different clusters. It doesn't mean that we look at the receptor picture, the wall picture, not only the ER2 or the HRERPR, we see that there's much more diversity and actually uh, the unique subtype is not enough to define a cell line. And we further look at how those different cell line and subtype uh, respond to growth factors. So I won't enter the details, this is just a large uh, summary of the, what we observe across the different subtypes. And on the left, you have the triple negative cell lines. And what came out of this analysis is that, uh, in general, those cell lines are responsive to many different ligands. Especially, you see here that all the ERB ligands, as well as NGF, HGF, and insulin, are inducing a response in both AKT and ERB. So the width of those arrows show how strong the response is, on blue toward phospho ERB, and on red toward phospho AKT. Then the outer ring is the level of the receptors. So you see in the triple negative a rather large level of EGFR. And the darkness show how strong they are phosphorated in the basal state. So indeed, uh, EGFR is highly phosphorated in triple negative. If we switch to the ERT amplifier subtype, the key thing is this high overexpression and overactivation of ERB2, as shown here, which also induces a high activity of the other ERB receptors. And this is correlated with a lack of response to many growth factors except the ERB ligands. So the four ERB ligands that we tested, EGF, BDC, Epirigon, and Eregulon, induce a strong response uh, both on ERB and AKT, but no other ligands are able to induce a response. And finally, the last subtype, which is the hormone positive, is characterized by 
no particular activity of the receptors, but a very strong response on ERK, a strong bias actually, as you see with the blue line or blue rows being rather wide, whereas only heregulon can induce a response in AKT among the, urge, uh, the hormone receptor positive cell lines. So this was basically a question of how those pathways are activated. And now we address the reverse question is like how those can be inhibited by, by kinase inhibitors. And in particular, like are the response different across the cell lines? Do, can we basically collapse or cluster the different kinase inhibitors based on the transcriptional response? And finally, we're going to relate that also to the phenotypic response, basically growth inhibition. So to do this, this work actually, uh, okay, so this is a very brief um, illustration of what we're looking at. So at the level of receptor, we're going to target uh, all the RB, so the different RB receptor, FGFR, IGF1R, so in the main uh, receptor found in breast cancers. We're going to focus also on the two canonical pathways, the MEC, ERB pathway, and the PI3K, AKT pathway. We're also going to test kinase inhibitors that target different kinase of the cell cycle, especially the CDKs, or the ORA and PLK. And there are also a few other uh, kinases, especially non-RTKs, that will be targeted and tested here. So if you want to basically uh, test all those different uh, uh, pathways and, or, and inhibit the different can I say that leads to many different conditions? So it's indeed we end up having uh, more than 8,000 conditions because we tested six different cell lines, more than 100 kinase emitter across six doses, and we tested two and 24 hours. And there was indeed an ideal data set to collect with the 1,000 because of the large, the breadth of the data and uh, the large output. So just to mention, because I'm going to put that as a validation later. We had already collected such data set at the beginning of Link Space 1 in 212, and we basically recollected everything with a better set of kinase inhibitors and also slightly different doses and time points. But in general, we have those two data sets that are consistent, and I will show that the results are and the analysis are also consistent. So this data set is accessible through the Link Cloud. And, uh, through the work with Avi, of Avi Mayans, we also have a Canvas browser for the data set that is accessible through our links website or through the general links website, where you can query and look at the different uh, perturbation, what are the genes that are up and down regulated. So we'll let you discover that. Uh, I will here present more our latest analysis on this data set. So the way we analyze the perturbation is through the characteristic direction developed by Neil and uh, other members of uh, Avi Mayans lab. In brief, uh, for each uh, perturbation, which is a combination of a cell line, a drug, a time point, and a dose, we had a few replicates. So this is illustrated here, followed by the red dots, and the control will be those dots down here. Then what we do with the character's direction is to define the, uh, the plan that best separate those two groups, the control and the perturbation, and give us a direction, which is the, basically the LD in technical terms. And this also gives us a p-value. So basically, we only consider the perturbation that are significant. And then we can define angle between the different perturbations, which is the logical use when you consider a characteristic direction. So each perturbation can be analyzed this way, and then each pair of perturbation can have a defined cosine distance. So now we can aggregate the perturbation based on their cosine distance. So this is a network representation of the whole data set. In that case, I only display the perturbation that are significant, and there is an edge if the cosine distance is below a certain cutoff, which in that case is 0.52. And as you see here, uh, there is different clusters. It's colored by cell line, and the size of the dots are the different time point. So on the lower right, you have many perturbations that are three hours, small dots, and the cluster is composed of mixed cell lines, whereas the remaining of the data set is in different clusters, as you see here, uh, that's the larger dot at 24 hours. 
if you focus on the identity of the cell lines, we found clusters that are mix of cell lines. Again, the one at three hours, this cluster in the middle at 24 hours, and there are clusters that are cell lines specific on the left here. So the question is like, what, why are there differences between clusters? And if you overlay, instead of having the cell lines, but the target of the drugs, what we observe is that the two clusters that are very close and that are mixed of cell lines on the bottom right and the middle are mainly due to drug targeting the cell cycle. So the CDK inhibitor, the CHECK1 inhibitor, and those different drugs. Whereas the clusters that are more specific by cell lines are generally induced by PI3K mTOR inhibitors or the different RTK inhibitors. So now we use another approach. We basically have a systematic way to cluster those perturbations based on the angle. Uh, so just to mention, as we cluster based on the angle, we will not differentiate the amplitude of the perturbation. It's just the identity of the gene and not how strongly they are induced or unregulated. So if we split the data set in 22 clusters, which is an arbitrary number, but the results are rather consistent if we change the number of clusters, we obtain this pattern here, where the first thing that we see and confirm the network shown before is that most of the clusters are time point specific. And there are actually more clusters at 24 hours than three hours. We found more perturbation to be significant at 24 hours. That's the reason. But if we take those clusters at 24 hours, as you observe, as we already discussed before, there are a few of them at the left that are mixed of cell lines, whereas a big chunk of them are cell lines specific. And this, again, shows that the clusters that are mixed on the left are induced by perturbation that affect the cell cycle whereas the clusters that are specific are induced by kinase inhibitors, RTK inhibitors, uh, PI3K inhibitors, or MAC inhibitors. So this is the same network as before, but now the dots are colored by the cluster that we found with this approach, and you see that in general you have a good clustering. Now, as a validation, mm -hmm. I just want to show the data we obtain in the phase one of links with the LGP12 data set. This is the same approach for clustering based on the characteristic direction, and you see, again, a mix of clusters, the cluster of mix of cell lines, and clusters that are cell lines specific. The clusters that are cell lines specific are, again, uh, PI3K inhibitors, AKT inhibitors, or MAPK uh, RTK inhibitors on the left here. So as we have clusters that are cell lines specific, now we can focus on each cell line individually and try to understand what differs between them. So if we take, in this case, uh, hs 578 t at 24 hours, what we see is that there are clearly two poles in that network. So in that case, I remove the CDK inhibitors and focus only on the RTK, PI3K, mTOR inhibitors, and the MAPK inhibitors. There are those two poles are basically on the top, the PI3K mTOR inhibitors that are clustering close to each other very consistently. On the bottom, are the MAPK inhibitors, and in the middle are a few RTK inhibitors that are either with one or the other, but not clearly clustered. If we switch to another cell line, MCF10A, uh, this is a slightly different picture, so we still have the two main poles uh, with the PI3K inhibitors or the MAPK inhibitors, but in that case, all the EGFR inhibitors, and that's almost the only RTK inhibitor that have a significant perturbation, all those EGFR RB2 inhibitors are clustering with the MAPK pathway, as well with a few uh, ABL inhibitors. Now, as a last example, SKBS3. So in that case, we don't have a MAC inhibitor cluster. What we see is that the PI3K AKT mTOR inhibitors are clustering with the EGFR RB2 inhibitors. So now we basically try, can try to understand and interpret those results. And this is another way to illustrate the data. So you have here in the middle an axis where both poles are the pediatric mTOR inhibitors and the right the MAC inhibitors. And the different perturbations are basically grouped and the target of the kinase inhibitor is displayed here. So what we see, again, those two poles here, and then the different kinase inhibitors, especially the RTK inhibitors that are kind of spread in between, RTK and non-RTK. And 
What is interesting is that uh, HS57 TAT is among the six lines that we tested, the only one that have a high level of PTGFR that express also that also responds to VGF, that responds to HGF, and all those different uh, RTK, especially in that case, the kinase inhibitors targeting those RTK are found in the transcranial response. So it seems that there is a relation between the expression of the kinase inhibitors and the transcriptional response. Now, if we look at MCF10 and SKBS3, uh, we can address, we can ask the question like, why is there a bias, especially for the EGFR ERB2 inhibitors? So in the case of 10A, that has a high level of EGFR, high activity also of EGFR, we see in the transcranial response to kinase inhibitor that it cluster with the MAPK pathway inhibitors. Whereas in the ligand response, we see that the ERB ligands are actually inducing both AKT and ERB. And interestingly, in the case of SKBR3, the response to the ERB inhibitors is uh, biased toward AKT, as we see here, but we also have, a, let's say, symmetric response to the ERB ligands. So that basically contrasts uh, between uh, the ligand response, which is able to induce both pathways, and the response to kinase inhibitor, which is biased toward one or the other pathway. And in that case, it's kind of expected that SKBS3 has a bias toward AKT, because SKBS3 being an urge amplified has a high uh, RB2, a high phosphor RB2, and that signals through the AKT pathway. So this is the same result for the different cell lines. So what basically we conclude from that is using the kinase emitter allow us to probe how the pathway are connected and how especially the non-RTK and the RTK map to the AKT PI3K mTOR or the MAPK pathway. So this is the data with the point. So this is basically all the different perturbations that we tested that are overlaid here based on how far they are from each pole. And on the last point, uh, we tested or we tried to compare those transcranial response to the effect on growth after three days. So we used the same plate, but we treated the cells and instead of measuring the transcranial response, we measure the growth after three days using microscopy. And in most of the cases, there is an inhibition of growth, but we found this interesting case for BT20, as shown here in the middle, where most of the perturbation hardly inhibit growth in that cell line for the RTK MAPK inhibitors, whereas all the PI3K mTOR inhibitors have a strong impact on growth. So we have a strong contrast, and in that case, we have the RTK and MAPK inhibitors that induce a transcranial response, but doesn't block growth. Don't block growth. It's illustrated here. So on the left, you have the same clustering based on the target of the drugs, the large cluster of PI3K m inhibitors on the left, a smaller cluster of MAPK inhibitors and EGFR inhibitors on the bottom, and the right part of this illustration show the effect on cell growth. On, and as you see here, the red dots show that actually you have a cytotoxic effect, uh, whereas the blue on the bottom show that the cells are growing also a bit slower, but they are still growing after treatment with the MAPK or EGFR inhibitors. And we, tell, we basically wanted to look at what are the genes and if we can find something interesting in the identity to explain that the cells are, are still growing also, they do respond. And what was striking is if you look here on this uh, gene Mark, set on which one, yes? Can you say something about that outlier in that previous slide, that blue dot? At the bottom here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, this is, um, so this is an interesting, I don't know. We have been a bit excited about that because as you can see, it has been observed also in other conditions. So I'm sorry to go back. This is the same agent as observed here. And basically by tracking back the batch, we realized that this was a mislabeled agent. So it was labeled as a PI3K gamma inhibitors, but actually we didn't have the right compound. So the company didn't send us the right compound. And uh, as we had some stock, we were able to test it and compare to a new compound that we order and realize that we didn't have the right compound. So it's certainly not the PI3K gamma inhibitor that we expected to have that was labeled as such. So we have to discount this, this, uh, this drug actually. 
So because of the annotations and having still some stock in the house, we were able to really confirm that it was uh, an experimental error and actually there was no other interesting biology there. So going back to here, uh, we look at gene set enrichment for those two, uh, for the signatures of those two clusters. And interestingly, we found a down regulation of a gene that are related to the cell cycle in both clusters. So it means that, as expected, the PI3K inhibitors down regulate cell of the cell, uh, gene of the cell cycle, but also the MAPK and ERB inhibitors. And if we look at what is the leading edge, actually, we see that also they inhibit the same group, but there's some overlap, but there are also some genes that are specific. So we can basically, in particular, for example, MIC is only in the uh, cluster with the MAPK and ERB inhibitors. So we can hypothesize that this cell line may not depend on some of the genes downstream of the MAPK pathway. And uh, only the genes that are uh, downstream of the PITK ATPK pathway are key to inhibit growth. But we still wanted to test what is this effect uh, uh, in combinations. And interestingly, uh, if you use uh, AKT and PS3K inhibitors together, you don't get any synergy. There's a bit of a synergy, but it's not very strong. And especially in comparison to combining a MAC inhibitor with either PS3K inhibitors or an AKT inhibitor, where there is a regime where you get a very strong synergy. Especially here, where the AKT inhibitor on its own has little effect. The MAPK inhibitor has a very little effect on growth inhibition, but the combination is actually cytostatic. So we get for something which is like 20 to 30% of growth inhibition to almost 100% in that particular case. So we can basically see it this way, like the MAPK inhibitor with its functional response enhanced the effect of the PI3K mTOR inhibitors or the AKT inhibitors that are actually doing more or less the same thing. Can you now, explain those plots a little bit slower so we understand what in each square? Yeah, so let's go back to the, to the square. So this is a drug combination assay. So on each axis, on the left column and the top bar, you have each drug as a single agent. So if we take the plot in the middle here, uh, do you see my mouse, by the way? Yes. Okay. But, so if we take that column here, we have a dose response for AZD8513, which is the MAC inhibitor. So basically, the corner is the control. There is no drug. And then you see a rather flat response with a bit of gross inhibition, uh, but not really any effect when you increase the dose. On the top bar here, what you see is the effect of the PFK inhibitor, GSK105. And you see that at the lowest dose, there's little effect. And then at the highest dose, it's actually sort of static and sort of toxic, sorry. And then everything in between is the combination. So basically, this uh, square here is the lowest, the combination of the lowest dose of both inhibitors. And the further you go to the right and the bottom, the higher are the dose for each of them. The colors is, so we measure in that case the relative growth. So as we had a day zero assay, where we counted the cell at day zero, and then at day three, we know what was the seeding density. So we can assess if the effect of the drug is cytostatic, or if we do have some cell thinning and we have basically a cytotoxic effect. So blue, as again, is the control, white is cytostatic, and when it starts to be in this gray color, it's cytotoxic, gray, reddish, pinkish color, it's cytotoxic. So again, to interpret this graph, you see that as a single agent, you do have an effect after around 0 0.3, 0 0.5 uh, micromolar. MAPK has a bit of, a MAPK inhibitor has a bit of an effect, but rather flat, and then the combination is pretty potent. The bottom plot shows the excess of a bliss index. So basically, uh, what it means is, based on the effect of each individual drug, you expect a combination effect, and then if you have more than that, you get in the yellow, meaning that you have something synergetic. If it's black, it's just additive, and anything blue means that it's antagonist, so lower than the expected effect. Is that clear? I guess. Okay. So now we have this uh, combination that is 
rather potent and synergetic. The combination of a MEK inhibitor with a PIPK or NAKT inhibitor. But what we would like to have is something that is more specific to that given cell line. And to do that, we exploit this clustering of drugs. So as I showed before, the MEK inhibitors, let me just show it again, the MEK inhibitor induces more or less the same response as the EGFR inhibitor in that particular cell line. So basically, we try to substitute the MEK inhibitor by an EGFR inhibitor. And you get a bit of synergy too. It's not as strong here with the PIPK, but it's very potent with the AKT inhibitor. As you see here, again, all both single agents, the EGFR inhibitor and eratinib having little effect at the low dose, but in combination with the AKT inhibitor, induce a static uh, response of BD20. This is strongly synergetic. And it's also the case with the SARC inhibitor as shown here, or the SARC with the PIPK inhibitor as shown here. So basically, we use that to get a more specific combination. And just as a control, so that's basically what it goes here. Now, the, MEG, the response of the MEK inhibitor can be substituted by the ERB or the SARC inhibitor. And as a control, if you try to inhibit both ERB and MEK or SARC and MEK, you don't get anything synergetic, as shown here. So the conclusion and we still have to further validate that and test it also in other cell lines, but it looked like the transcriptal response and the L1 tunnel allow us to find combinations that are synergetic. So basically try to combine drugs that have slightly different effects on growth, but that will be complementary. And then to gain on specificity by basically going upstream in the pathway uh, because we know how the different kinase inhibitor uh, cluster. And with that, uh, I would like to thank everybody involved in the project. So we have a large team at uh, HMS that helped us, that uh, actually did uh, the cell culture, treated the cells. And uh, we have the people at the broad, uh, especially Arabin and his group. Uh, Avi uh, Chanan did a lot of work on the character cell direction. And um, a few other people involved in links at HMS. And with that, I'll be happy to take any question. So I have one question about the transcription factors that are potentially upstream between the kinases and the expression changes. Do you think you can identify also the transcription factors that are involved? So I try a few things now. There is, so basically this is based on those kind of analyses they're trying to find the transcription factor. Now, uh, there's still a question like how much we can get from the L1000 as we have only a subset of the genes. Uh, but this is one of the analyses I would like to see uh, to, to actually do and see how consistent it is across the perturbation. I think you definitely have to do the extrapolated, use the extrapolated expression, not just the L1000. So basically doing an enrichment on the whole infer gene set, not yes. just the 1,000. Yes. So that's on your, based on your experience, that's actually something valid that you can get reliable results on that? Or? Uh, I think so, but it, I, there is only, um, you know, it's only a prediction. And then the question is like how hard it would be to validate it, or how would you validate it experimentally, or whether you need to, because that's sort of like opens a whole other regulatory. Yeah. So we we have been running basically some biochemical validation. So for now, we're mainly looking at, at phospho-AKT and phospho-ERX to basically see 
in B220 if we have what we expect and what we get especially with the combination. But I think indeed uh, uh, we can follow up that uh, with an assay that will focus on the transcription factor that are in between this phospho-ERK, phospho-AKT level and the transcription response. And we should have some kind of convergence between the infer transcription factor activity and what we kind of expect from how PKT and phospho-ERK is downregulated. And uh, that's probably the, the kind of last point to fit in that story. If we get the phospho-AKT and phospho-ERK level as expected and we have that social response, uh, it's probably a very good point to validate how the transcription factors that are in between are behaving. Are there any other questions? Does it look like it? Okay. Thanks a lot, Mark. All right. Thank you very much. And um, Thank as you. you yeah, you can always, if you have any other question, uh, I'll be happy to answer by email or follow up with you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Sounds good. I'm, I may follow up. Uh, I was thinking about a few things, but it's probably, probably not too useful for this meeting. Yeah. Thanks so much. Great presentation. Sure. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.